fine art in 1960, and her artistic endeavor as a painter shows that she has a distinctive artistic creativity and visual skills. And following her graduation with, uh, graduation with her background in fine art, she could find a job, job as a secretary to the chairman of the Department of Architecture at the Harvard University Graduate School of Design, and then she applied and got in that program in 1966. Without a, woman, without a woman role model in architecture, she began her studies in this field and obtained her degree in 1969. In her class, there was one woman and no woman professor at the department, and she couldn't remember any women architects in architecture history at that time. As she expresses, she loved the architects of the past, Anthony Gaudi and Charles René McIntosh especially. When she was a woman architect student at Harvard University, her involvement with a woman's liberations in Boston in 1968 can be seen her consciousness to empower women. And in terms of her earlier in architecture, it can be said that it can be said that her form formation was shaped under the academic leadership of Jose Luis Sard, the dean at Harvard University Graduate School of Design. Shaping urban design program with the integration of architecture at Harvard University, his academic agenda deal with the influence of creative visual languages and art on architectural culture and human habitats. And during her architecture education at Harvard University, Carol was most helped by the partners at Cambridge 7, whose practice philosophy is based on collaborative spirit and humanistic approach in architecture. And following her education at Harvard University, she applied to Princeton University in 1970, and in a class of eight, there were only two women, and it was much more inclusive than Harvard, as she in the case. At Princeton University, she studied with Michael Graves like Marlin, and the project of her master thesis was the design of the art building and museum at Smith College. As she points out, architectural education at Harvard University was much more technically and construction driving and influenced her career path rather than Princeton University. And here you see her drawings. Following her master's degree in architecture from Princeton University, Carol traced her desire to architectural design and focused on its practice in the professional world. And here it's important to note that even today, according to the American Institute of Architects, Diversity in the Profession of Architecture Key Findings in 2015, women say that they are often encouraged to pursue interior design or other design-related careers in state of architecture. And considering this critical fact, I would like to elaborate her professional career in architecture very briefly. According to her biography, which she shared with me, in the beginning of her professional career, Carol worked for architectural office in New York in between 1974 and 1980, and there was no woman in the offices she worked for. In nine years after her master's degree from Princeton University, in 1980, she opened her own office in Dunkirk, New York, and conducted her own practice until 1998. And between 1998 and 2001, Carol was on the board at Harrington Sandberg in Jamestown and the only woman at this position at Steven Sandberg shared in his emails with me. And she worked on a very large public school project at, the, at this firm, as she expressed. Following this professional experience between 2001 and 2010, she served as the Vice President of Canon Design, which was established in New York in 1945. And if we look at the Board of Directors for Firm and Design Leaders profiles at Canon today, it can be seen that men got promotion to the top positions much more than women and what this shows why Carol's position at Canon Design as a Vice President deserves an attention. And finally, after her retirement in 2010, she preferred to stay active as an artist, focus on painting, and continues her production with her artistic creativity and distinctive visual skills. And on the slide, you can see her artistic drawings, 
and here you can see her sketch in Istanbul and some of her photographs from Istanbul. And her case shows us how an early woman architect from old boys schools could conduct her professional career in the field of architectural design practice, although women are often encouraged to pursue their educate their career in interior design, housing or in related fields. And in addition to this, she could synthesize her entrepreneurial skills and architectural background to establish and conduct her own practice in the professional world for 19 years without a woman role model. And with this educational and professional background, she could promote it to the leadership position in architectural firm, which are still male-dominated field. To sum up, although these women architects could unlock the gates of the, one of the outstanding schools of architecture in the United States, their career and its, its history could intersect with a scholar as they expressed when I contact them. In other words, as I understood, my academic research is the first study on their career. Within this picture, in 1990, a symposium titled Sexuality and Space, which was organized by Beatrice Colomina, a professor of architecture at Princeton University School of Architecture, brought into focus on feminist concern in architecture. In 1992, in her introduction in the, symp in the symposium book, Beatrice Colomina indicates that Work on representation and desire developed over the last 15 years by feminist theories have been conspicuously ignored in architectural discourse and practice. This is obviously part of a more general repression of sexuality in most critical discourses. In spite of these critical comments in 1992, these early women architects from Princeton University School of Architecture have remained invisible in the history of the schools. And after 10 years after this symposium in 2000, a book was published, Women of Princeton between 1749-1969. Although this book aims to elaborate how a woman Women have been a part of Princeton history from its earliest days and shaped the life of the university in many ways. It doesn't include the admission of women's architecture students to the university in 1968 as one of the significant historical threshold. In addition to this, one of the recent and significant books titled Architectural Schools, Three Centuries of Education Architects in North America, edited by John Oakman and published in 2012, in that book, in particular, Anne Mary Adams' architectural historians fills a significant gap in feminist history in architecture and underlines some early women architecture students in the United States. However, her essays, titled Gender Issues Designing Women, doesn't mention early women architecture students from Princeton University. In addition to this, in 2016, the University and School of Architecture witnessed two important thresholds while I was conducting my academic research at MIT. The University hired its first Dean for Diversity and Inclusion in 2016, Latanya Bach. And according to America's Quarterly, Monica Ponce de Leon, the woman dean of Princeton University School of Architecture and whose appointment was effective since 2016, is the first woman and Latin American to hold that position. And in 2016, a book, by, a book by Nancy Weiss Malkiel, a professor of history emeritus at Princeton University, was published by Princeton University Press. Keep the damned woman out, the struggle for co-education. As the Department of History at Princeton University introduces that book, co-education met with fierce resistance. And Nancy Weiss Malkiel explains that elite institutions embark on co-education not as a moral imperative but as a self-interested means of maintaining a first-rate applicant pool. She explores the challenges of planning for the academic and non-academic lives of newly admitted women and shows how, with the exceptions of Mary Ingraham Banting at Radcliffe, every decision maker leading the charge for co-education was male. 
In light of these issues, the gap in the history of early women architecture students from university and these findings raises a critical question as well. How can we integrate these women architects into the existing architecture history? When some significant women are explored, the next step mostly begins with traditional, measures, traditional measures of excellence, such as who are the great women. Here it's important to remember that good architectural work proceeds through collaboration, and it includes various profiles, roles and responsibilities of architects. And in order to understand how our build is designed and realized, we should recognize how diverse group of architects, con architects contribute to it in many ways instead of focusing on a great or excellent architectural profile. And finally, as a feminist scholar in architecture history who taught at Women and Gender Studies program today, I agree with Despina Stratikakos. Public events and lectures for feminist scholars at the School of Architecture are still rare and there should be much more effort how to incorporate them into the general programming. And in the end of my presentation and talk, I would like to express my thanks to Robert Hillier because he is the first person behind my findings on the history of Princeton University when I was a research scholar at Columbia University in 2008 and 2009. With his help, I could reach Metin Celik for my PhD dissertation research at Columbia University and then I could reach, first of all, Aliye Pekin Celik and then I could reach uh, Professor Geddes and continued my research. And thank you for your listening and attention. <laughs>